Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. It's like coffee with an analyst, but there's no actual coffee. Each episode, we interviewed an expert in the field of law enforcement analysis to share their career-defining stories and to get their insights on the world. Please join us on recognizing and learning from these brilliant minds as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 30 years of law enforcement experience, 18 years of which in analysis. She was an analyst in both New York and South Carolina. She's an analyst turned researcher, earning her doctorate in criminal justice. She is currently the ILEA president and owner of Virtual Analytics, a law enforcement analysis consulting service. Please welcome Dr. Sheila Dorn. Sheila, how are we doing? Good. How are you today, Jason? I am doing well. So actually, my first question to you is Sheila is a unique spelling. And yes. so where does that spelling come from? Is there a story behind that? Well, it's Irish. Uh, my parents blessed me with a difficult name, but it's pretty common in Ireland. I was glad when I went over to visit Ireland in early 2000s with my sister Deirdre that we were able to find mugs and keychains with our names on them, something I never have experienced in the U.S., but those are the joys of having a unique name. Jason, glad to see you again. It's been a decade or so since we worked together teaching the foundations of intelligence analysis. Yeah, what we were talking about yesterday it was probably 2009 we taught in Baltimore. Yeah. So it's definitely been a while, too long, but you've accomplished so much since then. So let's just start from the beginning of your career. How did you discover law enforcement analysis? Um, it was kind of a twisted path, actually. I've always been interested in policing since high school. I had a neighbor as a young kid, my friend Darby's father. We called him Big Joe Labby. He was a police officer in my hometown. He was one of those old time police officers. Everyone went to him. He knew everything. He knew how to solve the crimes and he took care of people's problems. And I don't think I was thinking in terms of careers at that point, but I always admired him for what he was able to do for our town. And in high school, I was actually interested in marine biology. And my dad introduced me to a neighbor who was a clam researcher. And they had a position with our police department as deputy marine warden. So I took that job. I worked marine law enforcement and environmental policing for the next 10 years, of which six were sworn as a reserve police officer. I really liked criminal justice, so I went back to school for my master's degree at SUNY Albany in criminal justice. So I happened to be in New York working during 9-11. After that event, I planned to go into the New York State Police, but I was really torn because my interest was more in research than it was in handling calls for service. And around that time, the Fusion Center, we called the New York State Intelligence Center, was conceptualized, and that was located in the city I was living in, Albany, New York. I was one of the first analysts hired to staff the Fusion Center as a senior supervising intelligence analyst. I helped to set it up during the next decade, wrote policies, procedures, training manuals, worked hand in hand with DHS. I had a lot of good supervisors during that time who really pushed us to get out there and work with the other fusion centers and work in intelligence analysis. So um, my interest at the time was really criminal intelligence, kind of as a precursor to the all crimes approach to terrorism rather than purely domestic terrorism focus. So I spent some time there, took a little time off to finish my PhD in criminal justice, had a couple of kids along the way, uh, worked with ILEA, the International Association of Law Enforcement Intelligence Analysts from early on back in 2004. I, I was a member and I joined the international board, which was all volunteer, which still is all vol volunteer as an organization. It's a group of over 3,000 analysts working internationally who are trying to 
professionalize themselves and develop career paths, training, research opportunities. We serve as representatives for the entire analyst community, federal committees, and on international committees. So that was kind of an outlet for me to build my community, my community of analysts, the people who kept me going, who kept me inspired about criminal intelligence analysis. Because being, you know, kind of a trailblazer in upstate New York, it was tough sometimes to maintain the energy and the interest in, in the field when you're out in front. So ILEA was kind of my outlet of networking, making friends, and, and building that community. So um, after that, I worked for the John Finn Institute for about two years. We staffed crime analysts in six jurisdictions in upstate New York, including Albany, New York, Troy, Schenectady for a short while, Syracuse, Utica, Kingston. So I oversaw, hired, fired those analysts, um, handled their training needs, and then uh, moved down to South Carolina when my husband retired from his job in the police department. He and I saw a job posting in Greenville, South Carolina, where I was director of the strategic planning and analysis unit, built that unit from scratch, built all their products, wrote their strategic plans and their community policing plans. And then I switched over to the research side of things, went full time working as part of my company, virtual analytics, and then for Clemson University, where I was teaching policing, and now I'm a research associate. I also work as a assistant professor at Michigan State University, where I teach in their crime and intelligence analysis master's degree program. It's an entirely online program. So a lot of different jobs over the past 30 years, but Altogether, it's pretty much in crime and intelligence analysis um, and working for the betterment of our profession. I'm really looking forward to some of the discussions that are upcoming about police agencies and how we can reform and reformulate police departments to be better at what they do. So that's where I come from. Well, you just gave a nice introduction for the whole episode, so we could just stop right now and go home. <laughs> <laughs> no, so that's fantastic. Thank you for all of that. It is impressive. A couple of follow-up questions. So you created two different units, one in New York and one in South Carolina, like you mentioned. So what were some lessons learned from creating these units? Oh, that is an awesome question. Um, I would say the lessons learned are to go in to listen, to learn from the people who have been there. I think one of the mistakes we make, especially as civilians, is to walk in and try to tell everybody everything. What I like to do is listen and learn from the people who have been a part of the institution for a long time. Make sure that their concerns are reflected in the structure of the division that is set up. Not to make any gut decisions right off the bat, even when I'm pushed into it by a supervisor or supervisors try to push me into quick decisions, especially in setting up uh, divisions that are new or that have primarily civilian personnel. They're kind of seen as outsiders, you know, mm -hmm. because you've been there as well as a civilian in law enforcement agencies. Sometimes it takes a while to break down those walls between the civilian and the sworn personnel. So what I like to do is listen, understand the organization, and then make proposals about how best to set up a unit and to work with the people who are already there to meet their needs. So I guess in situations where it's brand new, I'm thinking for the fusion center concept in New York, that's a brand new concept. So there had to be outside influences for you that you've used in developing that unit. Yes, what we did is we talked with ILEA and reached out across the United States to try to understand how other agencies were setting up collaborative partnerships. What served as our example at the time, because there were no other fusion centers, were the HIDA centers and the risk project centers. So for us, that was New York, New Jersey, HIDA. We spent 
a lot of time going down, talking to them, talking about technology, how to make it easiest to set up a unit that wasn't reaching out to investigators in the field and bothering them about reports and data all the time. But accessibility was a big concern and immediate accessibility was even higher as a concern. So taking a look at the risk project and the HIDAs, that's what we modeled the fusion centers on. The collaborative partnerships, the ability for analysts to give back to law enforcement professionals information and intelligence that was going to be useful not only for a single case like investigative support, but longer term, bigger picture organizations, criminal enterprises, bigger picture of criminal intelligence. So what I've always stressed as I work with law enforcement agencies, especially at the local, regional, and state level, is that the value of a criminal intelligence analyst is really that they can focus on not just the fruit from the tree, but the actual branches and the tree itself. Instead of viewing each case individually as one case to open and close, we need to start taking a look at cases more on an enterprise level so that we are focusing on the bigger fish. And that kind of a message is not only important to communicate as analysts, but it really meets the needs of certain units in law enforcement agencies. I'm talking drug units, gang units. It meets the needs of what administrators are looking for as well, because case closure rate is one metric that performance is measured by. But essentially, they want to eliminate all the enterprises, the organized crime elements that are operating in their jurisdiction. Eliminating the the bigger enterprises cuts back on crime numbers. So the importance of the analyst is in that bigger picture, showing investigators and detectives exactly what is needed in order to tackle the larger crime problems. So for those that don't know what HIDA or RISC are, HIDA is High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area and RISC is regional information sharing system and their multi-jurisdictional task force modeled. So they'll have folks from various agencies working together in one office. So for analysts that work in fusion centers, one of the things that I see with analysts that work in these centers is that they have access to all these different databases and they'll get an assignment Maybe they'll get a name or a case to work on. Their job sometimes is just to run this name or this entity through all these different databases. But the difficulty that I've had in working in these areas is you never know how far down the rabbit hole to go with these different databases. And so there's got to be a judgment at some point in time to where, okay, I have this entity, I have this person, I have 30 plus different databases. I need to make a decision on how far I'm going to go with each one of these databases, trying to search and expand my net with these people or entity. So do you have any advice for analysts that might be caught in this? Sure. We used to see it all the time, especially when we started and when we had new analysts come on the job. Their focus was on either being terribly thorough. So you have access to 30 different databases. And so you have to do all 30 different searches and just the preponderance of information that can be generated and potentially circulated to field personnel who have to make sense of it. So that's one area that training comes into play and experience with what the different databases can provide to you. We were limited from the start because a lot of the databases were paid resources. So they would charge even law enforcement to do lookups of information about vehicles, owners, homes, that sort of thing. So that artificially limited us to only using certain databases in felony types of situations. But in terms of investigative case support, it's a matter of skill and training to understand what information to provide to field personnel. 
an investigator in the field doesn't need 200 pages in an Adobe PDF of all the details that you came up with. They just want a summary and they want to be sure that that information that's in the background, that you've pulled it from legitimate sources and that it's current and updated. I think it's a training issue, but also an experience level issue that, you know, you kind of are able to fine tune what you're doing in investigative case support to provide the right types of information and the right amount of information. Yeah. Along those lines too, is I've gotten packets back from fusion centers and it's 40, 50 plus pages. It wasn't summarized at all. I would get pages where Basically, it was a screen printout of searching the database and letting me know that no results were found. Yes. So I'm just going through page after page of just no information at all. It seemed like they just had a boilerplate of, okay, this was the topic. We ran all 30 plus databases, did a printout. Here's your 40 page report on what we found. And really not too much analysis from my point of view was given. It was just more like a process of going through and running searches through all the different databases. Mm -hmm. And that's a matter of quality control at the management level. That's something we've talked about in the past 15 years. We've talked fairly extensively about law enforcement intelligence management. In fusion centers, you see law enforcement personnel come and go. Law enforcement intelligence and fusion and crime analysis tends to be a stop along the way for sworn personnel as they progress throughout their career. Everybody has to do their time in certain areas. We were seeing a pretty regular rotation of our supervisors every two to three years, new people were coming in. And as analyst supervisors, we were training and retraining and retraining management personnel, as well as training on the other side for new intelligence personnel coming in. So you have both sides of that equation. And part of the thing that I always like to stress is that, as you know, the definition of law enforcement intelligence is information plus analysis equals intelligence. That's the very basic equation that we're working with. And we can produce tons of information. I think the term is drinking from a fire hose. There's a ton of information out there, but not all of that information is relevant. So law enforcement intelligence is actually a result of an analysis process that provides an integration and analyst look at the different type of information about crime, security threats, people, criminal behavior, crime trends, essentially the threat environment in a jurisdiction. On the opposite side of that, on the other side of the coin, an analyst in one of these fusion centers trying to do your due diligence and do analysis, the requester may be tight-lipped over what they're going to give you about the case. While you might want to get more information so you could further your search, you might not get it. Yes, you're right. I've experienced that as well. You know, a name and a date of birth and you're told, I need everything you have on this individual. Well, you know, I need a little more, you know, the nexus, the type of crime, nexus to criminal or terrorist activity, a case number, all of these basic pieces of information are valuable to help an analyst determine how in-depth to go. I mean, if this is an every three months you have to update all your warrants, then I'm going to do fewer database searches and I'll do different database searches than somebody who has been missing for two or three weeks. Different types of needs require different types of searches. Now, did you have any testing in place for your analysts? And the reason I asked that, I, I think back, we had one analyst that wanted to test our fusion system. So she put in her own information. Her actual first name wasn't what she went by, right? And she okay. had a really common last name. So she put in her information, tested what she got back, because obviously she knew all her information, what, what she would get back. Mm -hmm. And so when it came back pretty skimpy, she laid into them about it. And of course, that 
anger at everybody in there that, that she was basically sending through something that wasn't real, wasn't part of a case. It, they were just being tested. That caused some conflict there. And it was interesting to see there was actually not only skimpy, it was wrong information there as well. So in your time, did you have testing involved to see how accurate you guys could come up with information? We did, but those types of situations, because of the nature of law enforcement databases, have to be highly regulated. So the problems presented by the situation you mentioned, those types of problems are in accessing criminal record information or law enforcement data, not having an actual case associated with it or some sort of complaint associated with it. So we did try testing the different databases. We did comparisons of the different systems as they came through. Some have improved over the years, over the past 20 years. Some have not improved. We have had those opportunities, but they were regulated. So it was a matter of getting permission from supervisors and making sure that we documented that we were testing and for legitimate purposes and that we had permission from the appropriate personnel so that, you know, we didn't run into the situation of an audit uh, a year or two later causing us significant problems. And for those that don't know, the, all these access to different systems do get audited. So you can't just run your mother's boyfriend or personal stuff in there. It's it, all this stuff has to be documented when you run through all these databases tied to case numbers and they'll go through and make sure that these systems are being used appropriately. So Sheila, let, let's move on now because I do want to get into a couple of your analyst badge stories. For those that aren't familiar with the concept, these are your career defining case or projects that you've worked on and you have a couple to share with us. Let's start with the missing person case in New York that you worked on. Sure. So I was working at the Fusion Center in upstate New York the New York State Intelligence Center. We were working with investigators from Troop C out in Western New York. They had a woman who was in the middle of a divorce who disappeared out of the blue. She had kids. There was shared custody of the kids at that point. It was a situation where the Parents had access to the home and the children, but each one had a significant other that they were dating and had other places to live as well. So the punchline in this story is that the woman disappeared on 9-11 and her body had not been located. However, her vehicle had been located on a nearby driveway near the home, the residence. So in working with the investigators on this case, I went through thousands and thousands of phone records. Luckily, at that time, we had PenLink. We were able to import that information into PenLink and take a look at the pattern of behavior. Uh, we call this pattern of life analysis based on communications and who calls who, what time calls are made, things like that. So one of the things I noticed when I did the communications analysis, and I reached out to the investigator and spoke with him um, pretty quickly after I took a look at it, was that we're trained not only to look at what's there in communications analysis, but what's not there. What is normal human behavior? What would people do if somebody was missing? The story in her situation when I spoke with the investigator was that she went missing the night before. The father went to the house in the morning and the mother wasn't there or he was at the house in the morning and the mother wasn't there. So he immediately called for child care uh, to assist him. The father had never reached out to try to figure out where the mother was in the situation. Didn't try her phone in interviews with the investigators. He hadn't gone looking for her anywhere. And to me, that was an indicator, a lead, some a suspicious behavior. The fact that he didn't reach out to other people to try to ascertain where she was. He went about his day. He washed the van and had somebody detail it inside and out. As well, there was blood when investigators got a warrant to search the home. There were indications that somebody had bled 
in the house. The father was convicted twice and on his third appeal managed to overturn the conviction, but they did convict him twice without the body being present, which was kind of a newer situation, which was nice to be on the cutting edge of a situation like that. What did he think happened to his ex-wife? Ah, yes. So I mentioned earlier that she disappeared on 9-11. And his initial story that first few weeks was she must have gone down to New York City to visit friends and disappeared. I think she was at the Twin Towers at that time. So that was his story, which was an interesting twist. Oh, wow. And of course, her body was never found in the, the wreckage of 9-11. No, it wasn't. That's interesting. It almost makes me wonder is, was it just a coincidence that he killed his ex-wife and then 9-11 happened? Or did he see 9-11 happen? And then he was like, I'm going to go kill my ex-wife. That's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) Now, your second badge story has a happier ending in terms of law enforcement. It's another missing persons case. It is. And it actually came to me, I was working down here in South Carolina in the past couple of years, and it came to me from a Florida department, sort of secondhand. Somebody was asking if an analyst knew how to use a certain communications analysis tool. So I volunteered and said I could help out. And that situation was a young pregnant woman had recently told her significant other that she was pregnant with his child. And then all of a sudden she disappears. And they lived on the coast and they were trying to figure out what was going on if the significant other had some sort of role in her disappearance. And so again, it's a matter of pattern of life analysis. What do people normally do in the day to day? And you can tell that from communication patterns and phone and movement of their phones across a period of time. It showed us very clearly that this gentleman was not where he said he was in his statement and that he had engaged in activity that was very different from normal for him. He had taken a trip to a remote location and had turned off his cell phone for a couple of hours and then turned it back on and returned to his residence. When confronted with that information, he didn't confess immediately, but he was arrested and put in jail. They actually had a decent lead from that analysis to show that he was lying about his whereabouts. Now, did you have to testify in the case? No. What happened in that situation is I turned my analysis over to an analyst who was a federal analyst in the area, and they've testified. Was he convicted? Yes, he was. He was convicted of killing her. But they never found the body either in this case. No, they didn't, unfortunately. Now that you mention it, that's something that I'll follow up on because as far as I know, a year or two ago, they hadn't found the body, but I'll follow up. And now you've piqued my curiosity there, Jason. All right. (laughs) Your third badge story deals with risk assessment, and this is dealing with a civilian case. Yeah, I'm currently working on a case involving uh, risk assessment for a high profile family. Family members are going through a divorce and they're concerned about the children. One side wants to maintain very expensive security measures to safeguard the children. And the other side is saying that they don't need expensive security, that the children are not at risk of kidnapping or family's not at risk of extortion. And so that's an ongoing case. And it's really interesting the amount of information that's out there about us as individuals and what we can do with that information to try to figure out, are people susceptible to certain criminal elements? How predictable are we? Brings a a whole bunch of interesting questions into the frame. So that doesn't have anything to do with law enforcement per se. These are private individuals paying you for your risk assessment. Correct. There's a market out there. So that's more on the private business side of things rather than working in law enforcement for law enforcement agencies. And that presents a new challenge because I have to 
buy different tools out of pocket as a business in order to mirror some of the stuff that we do in intelligence. And some of the data that is available to me in law enforcement is very separate and I, I can't access that information on the civilian private side of things. It's tempting, right? <laughs> it's tempting. You want to get as much information as possible and you know yeah. that you have access to all that data on the law enforcement side. So it's, I can understand how it'd be tempting. It is, but having the perspective of seeing and working in law enforcement and experiencing what happens to people when they're wrongly accused of different things and how people can abuse their authority, it makes me push away and say, no, not really interested in getting into a mess like that. So definitely there is temptation and I'm sure some people with different morals and values might take advantage of that, but definitely not something I'm interested in doing, you know. I want to make sure that any of the products that I do, either on the law enforcement side or on the private company side, that they have integrity and that I demonstrate integrity throughout the process. So this risk assessment that we just talked about is your work as owner of virtual analytics, correct? Yes. Your company there, you're consulting with various entities, right? Not just private citizens. Correct. So I tend to focus more on law enforcement, sheriff's departments and local police departments, state police agencies, working with them to put together analyst positions, hire personnel, work with them to figure out how to properly manage and position that person within their department. I also do strategic planning, which is something that is really important for law enforcement that kind of gets pushed to the side because of the high priority day-to-day -day assignments that come across. So I really enjoy doing that sort of work. All right, well, let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about ILEA and I want to get into more of your research as well. You're listening to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Steve French, and I have a message to you about language. Language is really important when you're doing your job. For instance, it isn't a zucchini, it's a courgette. It isn't a lobby, it's a foyer. It isn't Z, it's Z. Buses go on routes, not routes, and it is never, ever made out of aluminum. Hi, this is Scott Eicher, and I am a retired FBI agent, and I just wanted to point out that FBI agents are people too. Hi, this is Sally Sarabar, here to tell you that nobody needs to know what first car you have, or what's your pet's name, or what street you grew up on. We all see these on Facebook, and we all want to answer them. But keep in mind that there are people who are reading them and they're going to go on your bank account and they're going to say, oh, I forgot my password. Let me reset it. And the bank's going to ask, what's the first street you lived on? What is your cat's name? And what color car did you own? And the person reading it, they're going to look through your questions and they're going to answer and they're going to get access to your bank account. And we call that social engineering. So next time you see that survey, that questionnaire, go. Welcome back. Sheila, I want to talk now about ILEA. You have been really active with this association for over a decade. And so a lot of my audience is probably familiar with the IACA. We've done a lot of episodes with people that are active with the IACA. Certainly, I want to have more guests on the show from ILEA. But I guess for some people that maybe aren't familiar with ILEA, could you just kind of generally talk about what service ILEA provides? Sure. Happy to share with you a little bit. So ILEA is the International Association of Law Enforcement Intelligence Analysts. We work to professionalize our profession, so to say, in law enforcement intelligence analysts at the local, the state, the national and international levels. We're here to help people understand what intelligence analysis is, the role of intelligence analysis in law enforcement. We develop qualification and competency standards internationally in intelligence. We do training and we set up training standards and training curricula. We provide research and participate in research with a number of different organizations to understand how important intelligence analysis is 
we disseminate information to our membership on analytic techniques and methods. So the professional organization of 3,000 people overall is brought together for the purposes of advocacy. We are advocates for our membership in terms of national level committees, international committees, and uh, as president, I participate with the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council. I sit on that, and that discusses intelligence in law enforcement agencies nationwide. I also am part of the DNI's Partners Board, which brings together a dozen intelligence and law enforcement personnel from across the U.S. to advise the Director of National Intelligence before COVID, we were getting together about twice a year. Right now we're doing uh, virtual meetings in place of the in-person meetings, but it's a matter of partnering with a number of different organizations and making sure we're all on the same page and that what we're doing actually benefits all of our organizations, benefits the state and federal agencies and international agencies that are out there, and that we're coordinating and working together for the benefit of our membership. What is DNI? Director of National Intelligence. Now, you had mentioned earlier that intelligence analysis being information plus analysis equals intelligence. Do you have additional information when you talk specifically about law enforcement intelligence analysis? I conceptualize intelligence as an umbrella, and it's a variegated umbrella with different sections in different colors. And so intelligence overall is the umbrella term, and it's made up of different types of analysis. So you have financial analysis, you have crime analysis, you have gang intelligence, you have national security intelligence analysis, and all of these fall into and under that same umbrella. So intelligence is overall, but you can specialize in different areas such as criminal intelligence. There is a lot of overlap between intelligence analysis and crime analysis. So even between the two associations, ILEA and IACA, there's a lot of overlap. So how do you distinguish between the two? Well, we aim our training to focus on the analyst and the development of the analyst. And we don't segment out crime analysts or financial crimes analysts or gang analysts. Everybody has to have a common skill set in analysis and intelligence. As long as everybody has that common skill set, if you look at the specific divisions, crime analysts, financial analysts, those all draw from criminal intelligence work or they're doing some sort of security or homeland security work or GIS. So we all need to have the same skill sets as our base. As you go on, you might specialize in certain areas that make you want to say, I'm a financial crimes analyst. You've been doing a lot of work with ILEA for years. What are you most proud of during your time? I think I'm most proud of the work our board has done in expanding membership, expanding the resources that we're providing to our members in terms of training, the different things we've written to unify the intelligence population. I think one of our biggest successes was uh, strategic planning, putting together a strategic plan to focus our intentions and make sure that our board of all volunteer directors were all headed in the same direction. And we use that document to guide our discussions at our board meetings so that we continually are moving forward. We're focusing not on what we've done in the past, but focusing on what's present and the future of the organization. Fiscally, we've come into a really great place. We are, our bank accounts are double what they were five, six years ago, seven years ago. Our membership is double what it was before I became president. And we're continually trying to move beyond the church model of doing things, which is, hey, I have a friend who can sit on committees with me. Um, <laughs> 
and that sort of mentality to a more professional and business model uh, way of operating. So when we have committees, we want to send it out to the entire membership and get a number of applicants back so that we can reach out beyond our small circles and really use our networks in the organization to include everybody. I'm a big fan of trying to avoid groupthink. Uh, I like working with people who challenge, who debate. That sort of stuff is almost a dying art in our profession, but I love contrarian analysis and stuff. And so I like working with people who don't just, yes, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, me to death. So I think I'm really proud of our organization for taking that next step to a business model. One of the things that we're looking at right now is hiring a part-time executive director. And I'm really excited to do that for our organization, work through identifying and hiring somebody who can lead our organization so that we're moving beyond the all volunteer model, the church model of things, and actually starting to tackle priorities and projects that need consistent oversight. So I think that's probably one of the best things that we've done as an organization. And I'm really proud of our team of directors and our board of advisors and our organization as well for all the things that we've done to get to this spot. The makeup of IALEA is a little different from IACA. I guess go over the different parts of leadership in IALEA uh, for those that don't know. Sure. So we have the traditional board of directors. So we have the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. And then we also have directors of certain topic areas. So we have a director in charge of professional development. We have a director in charge of training. We have a director who handles international affairs, membership director, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the group of people who meet on a regular basis. We do calls every month. Twice a year, we have formal board meetings. We also have an executive advisory board, and those are honorary positions where we appoint people who have distinguished themselves in criminal intelligence analysis, law enforcement intelligence analysis. They're appointed for a period of time to serve, and we reach out to them. I reach out to them to review documents, to advise us on different programs we might be undertaking. What do you expect out of the new part-time executive director position? I expect the new executive director position would be reaching out to further our membership goals and further our partnerships with different companies who have memberships. There's a special membership category for commercial entities. Those are things like Geotime, i2, or Esri, for example, ways that they can join our membership organization and provide webinars and things like that for our personnel. So I foresee building additional bridges with the industry and also expanding our membership because right now to recruit members and because we're a membership-based organization, you know, we rely on memberships in order to fund us and fund our training and our conferences and our resources and platforms that we use to communicate with people. So building up that membership, hopefully within two years, doubling our membership again. Now, do you think the IACA and ILEA will ever have a joint conference? I think it's possible. We've discussed it in the recent past. And if you know the history of ILEA and IACA, it's a unique history that is U.S.-based. In a lot of countries, they do not make the distinction between intelligence analysts and crime analysts. So that's an artificial U.S. distinction that we mm -hmm. are making. I think we might be stronger if we work together on a number of different topics. And we've talked about it on and off over the last few years. All right. I've been around long enough. It seems like about every five years I hear whispers about it. <laughs> and uh, some folks don't think it'll ever happen, but it's it's funny. I did hear the whisper earlier this year, even in the last year. So I do hope someday that it does happen. I think there's a lot that can be taken out of the two joining forces for our conference and put it on a great conference because there is a lot of overlap and I think there's a lot we can learn from one another. Sure um, is. It is something that I think will happen eventually. It's just a matter of focusing 
forward, right? Mm -hmm. Focusing on the future instead of embracing the past of what's happened. IACA was a group of analysts initially who broke away from IALEA because their needs weren't being met by the IALEA organization at the time. So we need to face forward and say what's going to be best for the law enforcement intelligence community as a whole. I, I think it'll happen. I mean, do you think there's still some sore feelings out there? I'm not sure. Okay. It's a good question. I would hope not. I mean, it's I don't see while. any on Ilya's <laughs> side. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. So uh, something interesting that came up in the prep show that we were talking about, crime analysis, you probably can pinpoint crime analysis somewhere developing in the 1900s. And there's different points and that could be debated. But with intelligence analysis, that's something that has a deep legacy. And you could far back as recorded history with the military presence. We just talked about the conference. If you go to an IALEA conference, you will see a way bigger military presence at that conference than IACA. And sure, so there's yeah. this deep history that, you know, you kind of got to keep up with the traditionalists, right? I agree with you. And I think legacy is a great word to use when you talk about that. Uh, we were chatting earlier in I mentioned if you look in the Bible, there are some examples there. You look at Chinese history and people like to take a look at Sun Tzu and quote different things that he said about the art of war and using intelligence, uh, military history for the U.S., military history elsewhere. So there is definitely a legacy. I mentioned earlier, too, that ILE is coming up on its 40th anniversary as an organization. Our incorporation was in 1981. So this next 2021 year is going to be a banner year for us. What we have to do is acknowledge the past and acknowledge all those people who have been there before us. I'm a big proponent in recognizing those people and memorializing all the work that they have done so that we can learn from it, but also so we don't repeat it. I find in a lot of organizations, especially in law enforcement, we repeat different things that have been done in the past over and over. We bring in new people. They're talking about the, the same topics because we haven't recorded previously a very good history of why we've made certain decisions. You look at law enforcement itself, how many times do new chiefs come in and they change the cruiser color, police cars, <laughs> yeah. the, the logos. I see police agencies, you know, they're changing and sheriff's departments, they're changing those every three years. And it's to me such a waste of time and energy and money, you know, to just rebrand under their individual names. To me, we should be focusing on the, our long term goals in terms of where does law enforcement intelligence analysis fit in the policing communities? Where are we headed in terms of? refunding the police and reallocating funds so that we're focusing on crime prevention, working with victims and meeting the needs of victims and their families, focusing on, on missing persons, underserved communities like indigenous people. Those are my types of interests. You know, we have a lot of people out there. Police can't meet their needs all the time. I mean, it's just a factor of things being stolen and we're not going to find them because they've been sold, they've been stolen by somebody who's not from the neighborhood and things like that. There's no evidence that we can find to track people, criminals down. So we have to look at more of a crime prevention approach to what we're doing and working the role of civilians into police and law enforcement agencies. We see their success at the federal level. We see their success at the regional level, entire Organizations are made up of civilian intelligence personnel. I think our time has come that we need to be a larger part and a more strategic part of policing agencies. So it sounds like what you're saying is you, with police reform, your expectation is an increase in analysis as opposed to analysis being on the chopping block. 
Absolutely. I think it would be short-sighted to put analysis on the chopping block, just as short-sighted as it is in chopping police officer jobs. I think much of what is going on right now is for political show. And unfortunately, we see from the perspective of law enforcement and policing that the people who are um, crying for change and who are outraged, you know, are also, you know, not decreasing their demand on police services. So the public outrage is kind of for show. So I really think that we need to sit down and um, make sure that we are reforming our police agencies to better meet the needs of our communities. But I don't think that cutting police or cutting the programs that we've worked so hard to build with our communities and our neighborhoods, I don't think that's the way to go. I just have one more question uh, with Ayalia. One of the things that I'm thinking about and just seeing the landscape from mostly people who want to be analysts and those that are studying now and trying to get into the profession, the internship is so important probably in many professions, but especially in law enforcement analysis to get the foot in the door. Of course, with COVID and the restrictions there, students are having difficulty getting internships. With both ILEA and IACA, I would like to see basically an internship czar, somebody that's going to go out and encourage departments to have an internship program and to feed that relationship between student and the profession. I popped this on you, so I'm sorry, but I wanted to get your take on this idea because I think it's been a struggle for students to find internships in the profession, but now I think because of this year, it's even harder. Well, you're right. We actually at Clemson had two students who were interning with us at Anderson Police Department, and they were very excited about seeing what it's really like to work as an analyst, meeting people, learning about the different divisions within the agency. And then COVID struck as of March. Unfortunately, because of social distancing, uh, we had to shut that program down. I felt terribly for those two interns who were so excited and who I felt responsible for, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of the work to put together internship programs is the responsibility so far, as we've seen, the responsibility of the academic program that is sponsoring those interns. So the different colleges and universities working to identify and get interns in to different police agencies. Internships and mentoring has always been a pet project of mine. Back at the Fusion Center, we created and brought through a number of interns. Same with Greenville Police Department and Anderson Police Department when I worked at both of those agencies. Brought interns through and and it's a really great experience for them to figure out. 90% of them say, hey, this is awesome. I can't wait to, to do more of this. But you do have some people who are like, no, this is just not what I expected. And I think I'm heading in a different direction. But it's great to reinforce those people who are really excited about going into law enforcement as an analyst or as a sworn police officer. So we see the value of that. And we see the one to one to one recruitment of individuals. I'd really like to see, as you mentioned, more of a oversight and maybe a single person working across multiple agencies or multiple states to do that. Logistically, it might be a little difficult. And of course, money makes everything better, Jason. So <laughs> really? <laughs> volunteers can be hard to find nowadays. So oh. Uh, we'd have to find a funding source, but I think definitely mentoring internships are really a vital part of people hitting the ground running when they walk in the door as a, an intelligence analyst at any level. One of the questions I like to ask people is what advice do you have for analysts or people that want to become analysts? And really focusing on return on investment, because I think when you're new, the canvas is blank and you can go in so many different directions, but your time is limited. So what would you recommend someone study or tools to use or something that will benefit them long-term? Great question. 
So I think when you walk in the door as a new analyst, you really need to take a look at your job description, make sure that you are meeting the different parts of your job description, get a basic intelligence analyst training program started and attend one of those. Some states have a certification program, some states don't. And we also have the ILEA certification program that you can apply for after you've been an analyst for three years working in intelligence analysis. Take a look at the different standards and decide if I want to be a professional, I'm going to pursue different things like certification and my, making myself a better analyst. And that comes from mentoring, uh, networking with people, reaching out and building a community, going to training conferences. Even if you get turned down, I know funding is always limited for analyst training in most of the agencies I work for. And um, so join committees. And sometimes committee members get to go to conferences and help out for a reduced rate. So there are plenty of opportunities out there. One of the things we've worked on that I, I'm really proud of what we've done is the Analyst Professional Development Roadmap. We put a committee together in 2019 as a subcommittee of the Criminal Intelligence Coordinated Council. And we brought in analysts from different experience levels and different aspects of the intelligence community to sit down and go over a previous version of the Analyst Professional Development Roadmap. Obviously, the role of the analyst evolves across time. It's really changed in, in law enforcement, homeland security, the private sector over the past five years. And in order to keep your career on track, it's important to take a look at that analyst professional development roadmap. The goals in the roadmap really haven't changed. So it focuses on training opportunities, certifications, and other professional development opportunities across time. But we want people to think of their long-term sustainable professional career path as they work either for the same agency for 20 years or as they move from agency to agency. They need to keep that in their mind and keep that in sight. I'm really proud of the fact that we've broken that down into four distinct analyst levels. So we're looking at the career path for people who are at the basic level. What do I as a basic analyst need in order to be a successful performing analyst? The other areas are intermediate, advanced, and also a supervisory section because it's come to the point where we have civilians who are in charge of intelligence units in a number of areas and for fusion centers and police departments. We have personnel who are making ranks of director, deputy chief, things like that. So we want to make sure that people have developed those supervisory skills in order to oversee intelligence. So we recommend training, we recommend the career paths, and we talk about incorporation of different types types of intelligence. You know, we're all operating nowadays in kind of a hybrid environment. So we're working with partners from fusion centers, tax forces, we work with different agencies, and it takes obtaining the knowledge and the skills in a number of different areas in order to be a successful criminal intelligence analyst or intelligence analyst. Good. The roadmap, well, you have that available to everybody on the website, right? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So we'll put a link to that roadmap in the show notes. Let's get into some of your research projects. Uh, you're on your way to being a professor. You have several publications. Is there any that you would highly recommend analyst reading? All my stock notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'd recommend um, taking a look at the work we've done in terms of the profession and standards for our industry. So analytic standards is a good one. I know it's currently under review and revision uh, because it's eight years old at this point, but I think that's a great document for analysts to read. Analyst training standards, the analyst roadmap, a, a lot of those baseline documents are really important for people to read and understand as to where we have come from and what our industry is founded on. So definitely take a look at those. Yeah, and you have something coming out about COVID too, correct? I do, and it's going to be about intelligence 
analysts and their roles, whether they have changed as a result of COVID. So surveys, interviewing analysts about their COVID experiences at work. Uh, we'll put links to these documents in the show notes. The last segment I want to get to is some of your personal interests. I was looking through your resume. At one point in time, you were an EMT and a firefighter, correct? I was. Wow, that's last from the past. I, yeah, but I do find that interesting. Like, how did you get involved in that? And any stories that you have from your time of being an EMT and a firefighter? Uh, so I got involved when I was doing my undergrad at Cornell. We had a Cornell EMS. So got involved with a couple of friends of mine. It was a good time going to different emergencies on the Cornell campus and treating people and getting them the what they needed. And then uh, I also volunteered for Cayuga Heights Fire Department, which was a volunteer fire department where I was a bunker. I lived at the fire department, answered calls for service senior year of college. That was a great experience, great being with the community, even while I was an undergraduate going to school. I just continued that being a paramedic and different experiences over the next decade, uh, working in EMS and volunteer. I was a little lighter on the fire side, uh, not as much of a fan of running into burning buildings. <laughs> as some of my peers were, but it was a great experience and I really enjoyed it. It was about working with people. You know what? I, I did deliver a baby. I wow. have done CPR many times, but on the plus side, the positive side, delivered a baby in an ambulance in Syracuse. He should probably be about uh, 25 years old at this point. <laughs> Almost right. 25. So there's a guy named Sheila out there? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> no, <laughs> not name it after me, but uh, uh, I think it was Dylan or. Man, that is exciting stuff. Well, you're definitely the first person on this show that I know that delivered a baby. So <laughs> kudos to you. You got a one up on everybody so far. Well, life is fun. You got to make it fun. Uh, you asked about my hobbies um, in my spare time. I have two Ilya children. They are affectionately nicknamed Ilya children because the oldest one has a birthday in early May. And so her first several years of life, we were going to the conferences and I was telling her that these big celebrations are for you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> and she fell for it because she was little. But as she grew older and savvier, she was like, hey, these aren't conferences for me. They're not for my birthday. <laughs> uh, but we were going good places. Like we held some in California, one in Florida at Disney, Texas, a couple of places. She, we wouldn't have normally been, but Ilya being part of the volunteers who devote a lot of time to it, going to the conferences is a big thing in our lives. So definitely she's one of our, my Ilya babies and she's 14 now. And then my eight-year-old, Old. I was actually supposed to be at a board meeting in Atlanta when, guess what? Rachel's birthday came around, <laughs> um, her actual day of birth. So I, I unfortunately missed that board meeting, but they're, they're good kids. We foster on the side. We foster children, and that's a newer experience for us in terms of seeing not the law enforcement side, but the longer term side of children and how the system really underserves them. There are a lot of good people trying to do their best for children who are caught up in the foster system because of criminal activity that is going on. It How old are your foster children? So we've fostered anywhere from age three was our, our youngest, and then 17 was our oldest. All of those have been through our home, about 10 kids in the last year. So oh, wow. we did some sibling sets, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and an eight-year-old. Um, at the beginning of COVID and we nearly tore our hair out. It was just mm -hmm. too much because <laughs> everybody was home. We were all on top of each other. Mm -hmm. It would have been different if kids were in school and stuff like that. And we had a little break, but there was no break. So this is a temporary situation where you're fostering children yes. until they go on to either, is it they're looking for adoption or they find a more permanent home? 
So some children in the system are looking for adoption, but most of the children we've had in our home are being returned to the family. The parents just need to comply with certain conditions that are put on them by Department of Social Services to make sure that they're not neglecting the children any longer, that you know abuse has stopped things like that. So usually the standard is three to six months is the children are out of the home. Very good. So the last section of the show is words to the world. And this is where I give the guests the final word and they can promote any idea that they want to. So Sheila, what are your words to the world? Intelligence analysis is a great profession to be in. If I was to do it over again, I wish I had started earlier and had school training and different courses that I picked up along the way, but I, I really would have liked to have taken these types of classes when I was an undergraduate or a graduate. So great world, great community, a lot of opportunities, especially if you are just coming out of school. This is a wonderful, wonderful career. Uh, Very satisfying if you can get past politics and things like that. I really look forward to seeing how we can participate in the different criminal justice reforms that are coming about. We've been involved in policing and reforming how police departments work in criminal intelligence and crime analysis for the last two decades. It's just a, a wonderful opportunity and lots of work to be done. So I hope you don't have an allergy to this type of work and you're excited about digging in, participating, and being a part of the endless community. Very good. Well, I leave every guest with you've given me just enough to talk bad about you later. Yes. I do appreciate your time, Sheila. Thank you so much for being on the show and you be safe. Oh, thank you, Jason. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for joining us today on Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. We hope you not only enjoyed the show, but also learned something new. For more information on our guests and information relating to today's topic, please visit our website at leapodcast.com. Special thanks to The Rough and Tumble for our theme song. For more of their music, you can visit their website at theroughandtumble.com. Also thanks to Kyle McMullen for our show logo. For more of his design, please visit his website at moderntype.com. The show is hosted, recorded, and edited by Jason Elder and written by me, Mindy. You can contact us both via the LEA podcast website. Please join us again next time as we interview another expert in this great field.